we're here in the Space Center in Huntsville, Alabama. This is the city that put a man on the moon. And just seeing the complexity, all the bits that had to come together to make it happen, but it did happen because there was political will to do it. All these Germans fled Peenemunde, which was their site in East Germany where they were building rockets. So the Russians ended up getting all the hardware and the Americans got all the people, you know? Okay. Turns out we got the better deal. You can recreate the hardware. You can recreate the hardware, but you can't recreate the people. And Eisenhower felt the first satellite should not have any sort of military connection with it. So he had a whole entirely different team working on the first satellite. It's called Vanguard. Then Sputnik went up and they were shocked. And they're like, we've got to put something up. So they put their Vanguard rocket on the pad. They lit the fuse. Boom! I mean, it was a humiliation for the United States. And they went to Von Braun and they said, what can we do? And Von Braun said, we could have gone a year ago. We could have beat the Russians. So, so where, was, where was that rival kind of civilian effort taking place? It was taking place, uh, I believe, in Virginia, New Mexico, a couple of different places. Not here. Oh, okay. Not here. So they came back and they, they threw this spacecraft together very quickly. Explore one and they put it on top of an army rocket, the Jupiter C. And so they threw all their rules out the window. They said, oh my goodness, we got to be the Russians. And they launched it, and it succeeded. And look at the Huntsville Times. Jupiter C puts up moon. Vanguard fizzles again, yeah. you know. Oh. Our moon, I mean, the pride in that. Our moon, we did it. This is the Saturn I rocket. So this was the first of the Saturn family. Now you'll notice something about the Saturn I. You see eight of these tubes around it. Yeah. Well, you know, each of those tubes was, it was a redstone rocket. The duct tape isn't there anymore. <laughs> just, it was just about duct tape together. Despite being called a Saturn V, it's a very different rocket than the Saturn I. It's not all clustered together. It's not all kind of jury-rigged. It's elegant. It was thought out from the beginning. It was designed from a clean piece of paper. It did not uh, have to inherit a lot of the deficiencies of the previous designs. I mean, the Saturn I is basically just a bunch of clustered redstones. And, and I think there's an analogy here for our, our work with Lifter as far as talking about taking the evolutionary steps and taking the revolutionary step. Yeah. Two major revolutions made the Saturn V possible and the moon landing possible. One was the decision to build a really big engine. The F1 is, it was a step change from what had come before. It is huge, over one million pounds of thrust. So much bigger, almost 10 times more thrust than the, than the H1 engine and far bigger than anything anyone had ever comprehended before. The other revolution, liquid hydrogen on the second and the third stages. Liquid hydrogen is a very efficient fuel and it makes the rocket lighter. Now we look at it and it looks huge, it looks giant. But you have to remember this was actually an extremely lightweight design compared to what could have been. It's really a beautiful design. Uh, we've never come up with anything since it's any better. The cruciform five in a cross shape, not in a pentagon shape. Yeah. In the earliest designs of the Saturn V, they thought they were going to need four engines. And Von Braun got mad at him. He said, that middle space is crying for an engine. And he told them to put an engine in there. They said, we don't need it, sir. We don't need to put an engine there. He said, you're going to need it. And sure enough, as they developed the rocket, the rocket got heavier. And it got to the point where uh, if they hadn't had that fifth engine, they would have never got off the ground. So he was, he was wise. He built enough rockets to know that here's what you think at the beginning, but here's what really comes along as you build it. You know, it gets yeah. heavier. Yeah. Performance goes down, weight goes up. You know, those are the two things. And, so if he hadn't been foresight enough to go throw that engine in the middle, uh, another example of how we wouldn't have made it to the moon. Right up there, do you see where that kind of green knobby comes out? And then the, it's, in a, it's the attach point of the entire engine yeah, yeah, to the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Now here's what's just amazing. It's called a gimbal. And what they have to do is they have to move that nozzle during blast off to steer the rocket. So they can't just bolt the engine onto the rocket in like five different places. It's a joint. It's meant to move. Okay. All of the forces of that engine have to go through that one little spot. Wow. And that is no small feat to engineer a gimbal. To, so you're taking all the humongous one million pounds of force through this, the humongous weight of this rocket pushing down from gravity, and it's all coming right into that spot that you then go actuate. I mean, it's just, it's oh, amazing. Wow. All of these things had to be flexible. They had to be able to accommodate changes in geometry because they were moving around during blast off to steer the rocket as it blasted off. A, a friend of mine gave me a great analogy. He took a, a two liter bottle of water and he just put a little bit of water in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And he flipped it over, he put the lid on, he flipped it over and he goes, now try to balance it. And I couldn't because all the weight was really low. I couldn't maneuver it fast enough. Mm -hmm. Then he filled it all the way up. Now it was much heavier and it was much more unstable 
but the center of gravity was higher. And so, yeah, I was totally able to balance it. He goes, a rocket's the same way. They're unstable, but you want them to be unstable in a particular kind of way. You want to be unstable in a way to where you can control it. Wow. And that was a real insight to me in <laughs> how you do rockets. Oh, Come over here to the F1. Ah, there it is. There it is. That's the secret. Okay. Take a look, guys. Here it is. That's the injector face of the F1. And it's very different than the injector face of the H1 because that's what they had to get to to prevent combustion instability. 13 different zones in that rocket to prevent the formation of uh, combustion. Here we go. Fuel injection follies. And you know that each nozzle as well, the two, the, they're paired and they're not yeah. exactly geometric either. No, that's they're paired and, and that's on purpose because one is the fuel injection and the other is the oxygen injection. Mm -hmm. And they're oriented in a way generally to make the flows impinge on each other mm -hmm. and to atomize and to make a spray. Designing the injector face of a rocket engine is an art all unto itself. There are people who spend their whole career doing nothing but that. Wow. Figuring out that. This is a model of what we're seeing above us, the Saturn V, and we're going to be able to cut it away. So here are the five F1 engines. Each of the engines has to get kerosene and liquid oxygen from these tanks. So the liquid oxygen tank has to drain through the kerosene tank, and there's five pipes that actually have to run through the kerosene tank, and you can see them inside the tank there. So they have to penetrate the tank at the top and come out the bottom. And then so you've got 10 pipes coming out the bottom of the kerosene tank. Five are from the liquid oxygen and five are from the kerosene. I mean, if it looks complex, it was. It was very complex. It was very expensive and it was very hard to hold everything together. And now we're down to one rocket. Now we're down to one. Now both of these engines are the same engine. This is called the J2 engine. And this was the other great breakthrough of the Apollo program, which was to use hydrogen as a rocket propellant. No one had ever done that before. If you could do it, the benefit was tremendous fuel efficiency. The but downside was you were starting from square one. Well, and, and also it's a highly explosive. It's highly explosive and it's super cold and it's challenging all kinds of materials that uh, are fine dealing with kerosene. You take 400 degrees below zero, they don't have a prayer. So they had to come with all kinds of new materials, new seals, new gaskets, new piping, new everything was new to build the J2 rocket. There was a part of Kennedy's speech I've always loved where he says, we will use new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented. Forward looking, it's like, we're going to use the same old junk we've always used, you know. No, we're going to go and, and make breakthroughs because we're America and that's awesome. And when they got to the moon, the astronauts went through a tunnel, they got in the lunar module, and two of them went down to the surface. So they actually had to undock, go down to the surface. Then the lunar module came up and had to dock again. If that missed, you know, two guys are going to die, you know. So, but they always got it. They reconnected around the moon, picked up the guys, then they let the lunar module go, and they came back to the Earth, all three of them. So that was the plan, that was how it worked. Kirk, building a nuclear reactor is just nothing. That's why I tell you, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a rocket engineer. I know how to do this stuff. Building a reactor is a lot easier than this. <laughs> now you mentioned computers. They had this thing called the instrument ring. Okay. And this is where they put all their computers and gyros and flight everything. I mean, look at it, it was built by IBM. So this is computer technology circa 1968. And this was state of the art. Now, just about everything you see here could probably fit in your hand now. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable how much this part has changed. It had no shower or sink. Astronauts washed with germicide soaked cloths and dried with Kleenex tissues. 14 days. I heard a story that when the Apollo 8 capsule splashed down and the frogmen opened it up, the stench was so overpowering that they fell backward into the water. <laughs> So who am I? Just you're the lunar module pilot. I'm the lunar module. You're the lunar. Move? You're okay. In the movie, you were uh, uh, you were Bill Paxton in the movie. Okay, Bill. Paxton. And I'm I'm Tom Hanks. All right. And over there would have been uh, Kevin Bacon. You know I'm already uncomfortable. Yeah. Imagine yeah. imagine six million pounds of rocket underneath you, <laughs> and it's about to push you at four G's that way while shaking you side to side. You're wearing a big spacesuit space with a giant helmet. <laughs> okay, and while you're doing this, you're going, tower check, and you're pushing the knobs, you're going, Houston, go for separation, you've got to be on lifting. my mark. You could have better lift your arms up. You did. They were able to go so much further on the moon, I mean, they were able to go like 10 or 12 kilometers away because they had these little lunar rovers. Are the wheels on? <laughs> and they crammed it in the side right there. That's awesome. If you were to go up to the moon now and put a new battery in this, it would probably still work. 
Seriously. But there's three of them. Oh, hang on, they left, they they're left it on the moon. Yet. They're still there. Three of them? Three of them. 15, 16, and 17. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. A little car on the moon in case you want to go get it. Okay, so we'll go over here to the Apollo 16 capsule. Is this is this is the real thing. John Young and Ken Mattingly and Charlie Duke were in that spacecraft for about two weeks. This, what you're looking at, has been to the moon and back. Here is a structure that has hit the Earth's atmosphere at 36,000 miles an hour. And you can just see where it's charred off. And you know, this hit the atmosphere at about Mach 35. You know, it was just unbelievable and it and burned like fire. So materials wise, is this one of the materials they had to develop or was it? Yes, just a this was called ablative material. It was, a, it was a carbon resin and it was designed to actually char and come off. And by coming off, it carried the heat with it. Okay. Rather than- uh, It looks to me like a honeycomb. It is, exactly, you, precisely. It's been honeycombed in there. So there's a, there's, a, there's a matrix and then they would lay it in almost like a paste. Britain, they have the crown jewels. In America, we have moon rocks. <laughs> and as they say, it is priceless. It is. It is priceless. And the fact we haven't gone back makes it more priceless. I've seen uh, rocks where they've sliced it, but I've never seen one where it's intact like that. Is this not here all the time? Like it's traveling? No, exhibit? this is the first time I've ever seen this. Oh. This is probably a traveling exhibit. Or you just have been so taken oh. with the engines you haven't got this far. First landing was at the Sea of Tranquility, Apollo 11. That was chosen because it was very close to the equator. It was a very, they thought it was a very safe site. As Neil Armstrong was approaching the landing site though, he noticed there were boulders everywhere. And I mean, they didn't have maps that showed him that kind of detail. And he had to take over from the computer with very little fuel left. And he really piloted his way down. I mean, it's one of those stories where, sometimes you hear stories you go, oh, that was overplayed for dram dramatic uh, effect. Yeah. effect. No. <laughs> On Apollo 11, the more you learn about what really happened, the more scared you get. You go, this guy was in big, big trouble, and he pulled it out by sheer wow. ability. He was one of the best pilots the United States had, and, uh, and uh, he proved it that day on, on landing on the moon. He, he, pulled, he pulled the rabbit out of the hat. So when he said, you know, Houston, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed, these guys were going, no. ah! Oh my gosh! He's still on Earth, he, his heart. I mean, I just can't understand how one human being can take that much pressure, well, that much kind of physical pressure, mental pressure. They said their heart rates were racing because they had their heart yeah, rate data did. and they were just going mad. But they knew if he couldn't do it, they were about 30 seconds from being dead. Now this is my favorite mission right here, Apollo 15. This was the first time they had a lunar rover and they went to one of the most spectacular sites of the moon, the Hadley Rill, which was in the, in the foothills of the Apennine Mountains. And they had an incredibly successful mission. If there was one Apollo mission I wish I could have gone on, it was Apollo 15. I think it was just hands down the coolest mission. <laughs> and then Apollo 17, this was the last mission to the moon. This was, uh, this was Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt, both of whom I've met in real life, both of whom are incredible guys. Harrison Schmidt was the first trained geologist and only trained geologist to go to the moon. So he went there and he was a guy who knew what the heck to look for. And so the, the scientific take from this mission was so vast by sending a trained guy there who knew what he wanted to do, uh, it almost eclipses all the other missions put together. And it really argues for if we could have sent more missions to the moon, if we could have sent more trained geologists, when you look at the scientific return from this mission alone, they went to the Taurus Litro Highlands, another incredibly beautiful site on the moon. See, by the time they got near the end, they were starting to go for some gutsier places, you know? Okay, because they, they weren't so worried. They were moving away from the equators. Cernan, he left the moon. He said, you know, we leave in peace as we came. And uh, he said some very noble words about we hope that we'll be followed. But he wrote a book about, oh, 10 years ago called The Last Man on the Moon. And in the, and in the preface he said, I did not want to be the last man on the moon. You know, I wanted somebody to go after me, but it doesn't look like it's happening. It doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, they had all the engineering and the pulling together of this huge systems challenge and they rose to it. It's really reminded me of uh, what makes America great, really. Everyone says, you know, we need to treat tackling environmental issues as if with the same primacy and the same urgency as getting a man on the moon. And actually, having gone through this process now, uh, coming to Huntsville, I kind of now see that we can do that, that moonshot, get that, get that technology out there and commercialize. There's lots of challenges, but there are really talented people around that can make it happen.